Hi and welcome back to Free Science Lessons. By the end of this video, you should be able to describe what's meant by homeostasis. You should then be able to describe the importance of controlling temperature, pH and water potential. OK, I'm showing you here an amoeba, which is a single-celled organism. And we find amoeba in ponds. Now, single-celled organisms such as amoeba are directly affected by any changes to their environment. For example, if the temperature or pH of the water changes, then this will directly affect how the amoeba functions. OK, I'm showing you here a human, and humans are multicellular organisms. Now, in multicellular organisms, the conditions that the cells are exposed to are tightly controlled. Scientists refer to these conditions as the internal environment. For example, in the case of mammals such as humans, the cells are surrounded by tissue fluid, and the pH, temperature and water potential of the tissue fluid are kept within strict limits. Now, the maintenance of a constant internal environment is called homeostasis. However, a key idea you need to understand is that internal conditions will always vary slightly around optimum levels. I'm showing you here how the pH of the tissue fluid can vary over time. The normal pH of tissue fluid is around pH 7.4. However, notice that the pH is sometimes slightly higher or slightly lower than the optimum value. Scientists call these fluctuations in internal conditions a dynamic equilibrium. And the purpose of homeostasis is to ensure that these fluctuations in the internal conditions are kept within narrow limits. Because of homeostasis, any changes in the external conditions faced by an organism have a very limited effect on the cells. OK, so as we've seen, homeostasis keeps the tissue fluid around the cells relatively constant. Now, three key factors that are controlled by homeostasis are the pH, temperature and water potential of the tissue fluid. And you need to be able to explain the importance of these factors. We're going to start by looking at pH and temperature. I'm showing you here the structure of a key enzyme in glycolysis. And remember that glycolysis is the first stage in respiration. Now, a key idea you need to understand is that enzymes are proteins with complex tertiary structures. And the tertiary structure of an enzyme is critical to the function of the active site. Tertiary structure is strongly affected by pH. If the pH fluctuates from the optimum, then the tertiary structure can change. And this could mean that the active site can no longer bind to the substrate effectively. So changes in pH can have a negative effect on enzyme function. Enzymes are also strongly affected by temperature. Enzymes function at their fastest rate at the optimum temperature. If the temperature falls below the optimum, then the rate of reaction will fall. So, for example, if the rate of glycolysis falls, then cells may not be able to produce sufficient ATP. And if the temperature rises above the optimum, then enzymes may be denatured and stop functioning altogether. You also need to bear in mind that many other proteins are essential for cells to function, for example, ion channels. And again, these will be affected by temperature and pH. So for these reasons, it's critical that changes in either pH or temperature are minimised. Both mammals and birds can regulate their internal or core temperature. And because of this, we find mammals and birds in a wide range of habitats. This includes deserts and the polar ice caps. And we'll be looking at thermoregulation in later videos. OK, now another parameter that must be controlled is the concentration of glucose in the blood and tissue fluid. And there are two reasons for this. Firstly, the concentration of glucose is one of the factors that determines the water potential of the blood and the tissue fluid. If the water potential of the tissue fluid changes, then water can move in or out of cells by osmosis. For example, if the water potential of the tissue fluid increases, then water can move into the cells potentially causing them to burst. And this could happen if the concentration of glucose in the blood were to fall significantly. If the concentration of the glucose in the blood increased, then the water potential of the blood would fall. And in this case, cells could lose water, causing them to shrink. So the concentration of glucose in the blood is kept within a narrow range. The second reason is that glucose is used by cells to release energy via respiration. 
So it's important that the concentration of glucose is kept at a relatively constant level. And we'll be looking at how the blood glucose concentration is regulated in later videos. In the next video, we look at negative feedback.